Grace to you and peace from our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. The text that I want us to meditate on today is the gospel that we had today from uh, John chapter 3, verses 14 to 20. But you can probably guess that I'm going to connect in with the other two readings because they fit so well into a real understanding of what this account in John is really speaking about. So let's hear John's words again. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, or some cases it says his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light And do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light. So that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Let us pray. Loving God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. You're a God who cares so much for your world that you do everything possible to bring your world safely home to you, to care for it, to protect it, to renew it, to restore it. And yet so often we live and walk in a wilderness, a wilderness of struggles of so many types and so many different forms. All of us have our time of wilderness. And yet, even in the wilderness, while you may not remove those things that we consider are causing our problems, you give the gift of grace to save and renew. So Lord, open our hearts and our minds to you today, that we may understand your love and see it for what it is your gracious gift to us no matter what. So amazing and so extreme that is more than we can ever imagine. In Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. So who's had a wilderness experience in their life? Any of you? Come on, if you're honest, everyone would be saying, I've had a wilderness experience. I've had times when things are just not the way that I believe they should be. We have it with health, don't we? There are times when illness strikes, troubles take place, and it seems like we're in the midst of a wilderness. We have it with relationships, all sorts of relationships. We don't even have to think about our closest and dearest, but we have it with relationships where we experience the times when we're shut out or frozen out of groups. And other times when we're overcome by demands from people where they want this, they want that, they want it yesterday or the day before. And it seems more than we can cope with. I don't know about you, but I have wilderness experiences and I watch the news and see all the things going on in our world and it seems so bad at times. So many disastrous events. And you know, it's so often that 
we look at wilderness experiences and we say, why hasn't God done something? Come on, God, get this right. Fix it all up. See, that's exactly what the children of Israel were saying when they were coming through the desert. Because something that wasn't said in that account, you know, they were complaining, they were, they were out in the desert and there was no food, etc., etc. Well, that was rubbish. Because the account before that, God was already providing them with food and drink. He was giving them morning and evening food. He was giving them everything that they really needed to live and taking them through that wilderness. So, what was going on? That's typical our humanity, isn't it? I was talking to a young girl this morning. She's not here now, so I can say this. And I said, do you get bored? And she said, yes. She gets bored. Dreary boring. Really boring. And it's interesting, isn't it? That even if we're doing things and active with our children, they get bored. It's, that's something for you to look forward to, Stuart and Melinda. Thea will get bored. Probably does already. She's getting a bit bored with the baptism this morning. It's part of our humanity. And often when we get bored, we complain. We want things done our way. And the children of Israel were in that situation. But, you know, whenever you go through deserts, there's, um, there's risks, isn't there? In every desert, there's risks. There are such things as snakes, you know. Australia is supposed to be one of the most dangerous countries in the world, so the visitors tell me. I don't know whether I found that for myself. I lived on a farm. I saw plenty of snakes. And a few times I was very graciously saved from a snake getting me. But you expect to have snakes, don't you, in a desert? You expect there to be some risks? That's what's in our life? We have those risks around? It's interesting how those Israelites who were in their situation in the desert, they had actually forgotten the fact that a loving God was caring for them in the desert. A loving God was there for them in that desert. He was feeding them. He was giving them drink. In fact, if you read the accounts, he was even leading them through and putting protective boundaries around them. In front, there was either a pillar of smoke due to the day or fire during the night, and behind was the other pillar. So he was surrounding them front and back the whole time, protecting them, taking them through. That's the imagery being portrayed. But how quickly we forget. Does this sound familiar to you in your life? How quickly we forget? How easy it is to think, oh, these disasters, what's going on? How can you believe in God if this is happening? A common statement, isn't it? But it's how quickly we forget. You see, when things work well, where God blesses us, we often forget that it's actually God blessing us. But when things go wrong, that's when we start to stamp our feet and get very upset. That's why the children of Israel turned around and said, we have sinned against you and against God because we've been complaining and whinging about what's going on. And so we're now seeing these problems as part of that. Pray to God and have him remove the problems. That sounds very much like our world, doesn't it? And whenever I listen to debates about whether God exists or whatever, it's very much the thing of, well, there's this happening and there's that happening and these things happening. How can you have a loving God if this is happening? And what we're really doing is we're forgetting the fact that we're in, we're in a dangerous place. We live in a dangerous world. Things go wrong. Get used to the fact of the truth of this place. Of course, the Bible gives us accounts of that and actually lays the result of the problem on us. Welcome. Welcome to the guilty. The Bible lays the problem on us because there's 
we are people who break a relationship with God because we're people who decide that we're in charge, we know what's best, we want it our way, and all of a sudden we're not trusting the one who has provided. The issue is about trust. See, this is what God goes about with those people there because he says, Moses, make a serpent on a pole Stick it there in the camp so if anyone gets bitten, they can look to that serpent and they'll be healed. Really weird, don't you think? I don't know about you, but I can't see any medical or scientific working in that. It was purely a step of faith because it was trusting God to be the healer. It was saying, God, you know what you're doing. One of the funny things I've found out about my own life is nine times out of ten, when I'm in a wilderness and I'm complaining about God doing the wrong stuff and it being a failure, usually I hear this thing about, just trust me, will you? What's your problem? Trust me. I know what I'm doing. It seems so funny, doesn't it, that even as a child, parents, children, how often do your children think that you don't really know what you're doing? Or make it a bit easier. As you got older, how often did you think your parents didn't know what they were doing? It's something about our human nature. We seem to think we know everything. We're in control. We can fix it all. We can make it right. But somehow God has to say, no, you don't know what you're doing because you don't really know love. We think we do. We think love, if love is really properly expressed, there would be no struggles and no uncertainties. But God's love for the children of Israel was not to remove the snakes, not to remove the problems, but to give a place of escape, a means to see God's work for them. And let's take that now to the gospel today. Because you see, in the first reading... The people read the fact of the snakes being there as God's judgment on them, right? And here we have Jesus coming. And it says here in John's Gospel that just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man has to be lifted up. Now immediately our mind, because of where we live and who we are, we think straight away, oh yeah, that's talking about Good Friday where he's crucified. But that's only one picture of him being lifted up. Yeah, Jesus was crucified on Good Friday. He died and he was buried. But do you remember the rest of the story on Easter Sunday? He was lifted up. He was raised from the dead. And not only that, but a number of days later, he was lifted up. He ascended to heaven. Jesus has to be lifted up. He had to come and be lifted up. And his being lifted up is the fact that he is there for you and I, just as that serpent was there, as an act of faith. You see, today Thea was baptised. We didn't do a magic ritual. Things aren't going to be perfect, Thea. I have to be honest about that. You're going to go through life and you will experience the wilderness. It will occur. That's a reality. But Jesus Christ was lifted up for Thea as well. That's why the sign of the cross was placed on her. It was placed on her as a reminder that Jesus Christ has been lifted up for her. Jesus Christ and his actions of love and forgiveness are for her and no matter what happens through life, God's love remains. You see, that's the real thing that's being said in this when it says, indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world. You see, we often think of Jesus coming as a condemning thing for the world, you know? Send it to judgment, put it in the fire, it's no good. But no, that's not what it's saying. He didn't come to condemn the world, he came to bring love to the world. Do you know why? I said it already. The world was already condemned. 
We'd condemned ourselves. Welcome to the group of the guilties. We wreck the world. We destroy relationships. We mess up God's plan. We destroy the environment. We are the wreckers. Let's be honest. Actually, it's Jesus coming that only allows us to be honest. Because you see, if we do not see Jesus being lifted up for us, Jesus making it right for us, we can't be honest. We have to turn around and somehow justify ourselves and make it right, don't we? Say, they did it, not me. Now, we have it in Genesis 3, where Adam and Eve do exactly that. Where are you? What's going on? Oh, did you eat of the fruit? Oh, well, you see, the woman you gave me, she just handed it across to me, so I ate it. There's logic and thinking. And of course, the woman, oh, well, the snake that was running around here, he had a few words to me and told me that it was much better and I had to believe him rather than you. Where's faith and trust? You know, when you're told, and you know this for children, right? Think of this for Thea, right? When you instruct them of what not to do, you know, don't play around with a sharp knife. You can cut yourself. What's going to happen? Usually the child will cut themselves somewhere because they experiment, don't they? Now, do you say, you stupid idiot, I told you not to play with it, you cut yourself? Foul foolish! No, that's not what we do because we love the child. And we say, oh, you cut yourself, look, we'll just have to bandage this up and fix it. Get you through. Now you've learned a lesson, haven't you? And you're not going to go playing around with it in the same way again. Well, maybe not. Some kids were like me, slow learners. Cut ourselves a few times before we learned the lessons. But see, the Son of Man was lifted up. It was an act of love, not to condemn the world. It was a way of escape. It was a gift to us. But most of the time we don't like to see that, do we? It's only when the Spirit works in us to open us up and say, you know what? I am a dirty, rotten, evil failure. I mess stuff up. Okay, I don't make it public or show it, but I use a lot of things that cause destruction to the environment. I've done things in the past where I didn't know what the right one was and messed it up. It's all part of that that juggle, isn't it? That hard part of us learning what does God really want from us. Later today, have a read of the Ephesians passage. I won't go through it now, but what you'll hear in that is the whole point about what I just said. About how we mess stuff up, but how Christ comes and changes it for us because of his love. And so while we might not like to see the light of Christ being there, him being lifted up to change things and show us what's wrong, he keeps doing that for us because his love doesn't end. Remember, Scripture says God is love. So often we think we understand love, but we don't really get it until we understand God's love for us and to us. So may we see that gracious love of God given to us, at times given in the harsh times, the struggle parts, but that he comes to us in the midst of the struggle because that's how he works. And he doesn't always change the struggle but he does give us ways to work through it. That's what forgiveness is all about. That's what hope is about. And that's what brings joy 
And so may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, that you may see in your walking through the wilderness that the God of love comes to you and that in everything that Jesus has done, he has brought his grace and love to you, for you and within you.